Hey y'all, new day, new verse, as we dig into chapter 11 for the first time, Jesus and John the Baptist. Today we're only going to verse 6, the end of verse 6. Here we go. When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his twelve disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is coming, or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who are not offended by me. Now, the reason I want to stop here instead of going all the way to the judgment from believers is because I want to talk about the fact that sometimes God will offend you. And God will offend you in a couple of different ways. Sometimes he will tell you to, well, get over yourself. He'll do it in a far better way, and he'll do it in a far nicer way. But even the idea there, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine, from chapter 10. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. That can be offensive to some. Being told that the things they're holding on to might be a little bit petty, might be a little bit pointless. You know, more than that, though, who is asking the question here? Because that's important, and I think it leads into the idea of why Jesus would say, blessed are those who, or God blesses those who are not offended by him. Because John the Baptist, he's the one who declared who Jesus was. He's the one who baptized Jesus, and, and he is the one who's proclaimed and testified to seeing the Spirit descending from the clouds as a dove resting upon Jesus, and the words, this is my son, good and faithful servant, in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist is the one now asking this question. Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds with something from Isaiah. Part of the bit of Isaiah that he left out, though, from quoting, was that the prisoner would be set free. And granted, if he says that to John's Bapt uh, John the Baptist for disciples while John's in prison, John's probably going to get a little miffed. But I think it goes deeper than that. Because Jesus is always working on something deeper. Trying to get to the core of the person. So, perhaps, when Jesus says, don't be offended to John, essentially, about the fact that he's in prison, or the fact that most of his disciples have ended up in prison. In fact, we were even told in chapter 10 that don't be afraid when you are hauled into prison. Because God will give you the words. So maybe captivity, as far as Jesus is concerned, is something mar mar marginally more important than just having shiny metal cuffs on your wrists or being in a particularly uncomfortable place. Perhaps the captives being set free that's more important is the captivity in here. The captivity to wrath, the captivity to sorrow, the captivity to these different emotional states, and captivity to the spiritual influences. Those are far worse shackles to me. Because if you are shackled to hate, then you exist in a state of hate, 24-7. So that even things that bring you joy eventually come to hate them. Because it's all you know. It's the only chain you have holding you up. It is all you have to go from. That seems like a far worse chain to me. Chains of pornography, drug addiction, sloth. An unwillingness to put others first. There are a whole lot of different things you can be set captive to. The need for power, lust. The want for control. The inborn, I have to control this moment. Oh yeah, all of those are shackles that human beings will often dive into happily. Because we don't call them shackles. We don't point out in mainstream society that being addicted to your lust and doing 
well, to be f blunt and rather forward, doing whatever your parts dictate to you doesn't make you an intelligent human being. It essentially makes you a functional raccoon, because it's the same kind of instinct, it's the same kind of knee-jerk reaction, just to simply survive. We're not called to simply survive. We're called to thrive. We have the means to do so, even in places like a prison. Because Peter, when he was in prison, he was rejoicing. Paul, in prison, is rejoicing. Stephen, stoned to death, rejoicing. All of these people holding out, praising God, and asking for forgiveness over the people who are harming them. Because the chains they're interested in are far different one. And calling people out? Oh yeah, it can offend. Offense comes, offend did is optional. So when those offense moments come, especially from reading the word, well, you can either say man, amen, or you can say ouch. And if it's an ouch moment, then give it to God. Ask him how he can help refine you and redefine you as a truly human being, his child as opposed to living with the brutality and barely functional behavior that seems almost simian-like that we tend to. And I know that my language here is particularly forward. I recognize that. It's intentional. It's intentional because I want people to understand that when offensive things like that, like calling people on their crap, calling out moments of, hey, if you want to not feel like you're living in shame 24-7, maybe don't spend most of your nights looking at pornography and trying to hide it from everybody. That's why we're told to confess our sins to each other. It needs to be brought into the light to be healed. So do we want to live in the light? Then that's the question here, for believers and unbelievers alike. Are you okay with the hell you're living in? Or do you want to live in a state of joy, rejoicing, defiant joy, hope, and always able to pour out love? And I can assure you, the ability to do that is not by our own hand. Human beings lack that capacity. But that kind of help comes from the Lord. And if you're not getting that kind of help right now from the Lord, dig in with Him. Ask Him to help realign how you're looking at the situation you're in. Ask him for his eyes, his ears, his words to speak. Because we're not called to play a game that's been going on for centuries. Games of, well, following whatever demonic spiritual entity we happen to call a vice. Because... That's the core of it. It's an idea that I don't think we really look at often, especially in the West. We're dealing with principalities and spirits of the air. We are dealing on a very different level here. We are dealing with spiritual influences. We are dealing with structural influences. Our job is not to go after people. And if you're going after people, you're doing it wrong. Point blank. That's the end of the discussion here. Take it up with Christ. He's the one who called out Peter for put, cutting off the sword of the high priest's servant. And yeah, sometimes God will offend you with that too. When he says, I don't want you to fight the world's way. I mean, it, it, it kind of even fits too when you think about it. Like, why wouldn't David be allowed to build God's temple? Especially when his heart was after God. Well... Because his hands were soaked with blood. It's still God's creation. Even if it's doing it wrong, it's still God's creation. And throughout the Bible, God will often turn people on themselves. He doesn't need us to go watching through or marching through as some kind of militaristic death march. That's antichrist behavior. We're called to live in love. 
And if we truly follow a God of all love who would take up his cross and that true victory of our king, the moment of his victory looks like his dying on a cross, then every way we're doing it needs to look different. The way we talk, the way we think, the way we act, the way we interact. We're called to share the love we've been given. If we truly want to, and we truly believe that God loves us as much as he says he does, then we should want to share that kind of love. And if it is not in you to love like that, Ask yourself, ask God why you lack the capacity to truly love. Oh, and don't think that I have for a minute it all figured out. I don't. <laughs> there would be times when I watch my own, my own posts here and be reminded of things. Because it is a journey. It is a walk. It is a relationship that we continue to develop and are continually built and grown up by the hand of God. But we have to live and surrender to being worked by the potter's hand. And sometimes that'll look like being told to get over your own anger. Being told to walk away from certain things. Being told to not do certain things. Not behave certain ways. It's a trial. But those trials we should be rejoicing about too. Not because the trial is there. No. The trial comes. No, we rejoice because God gives us the strength to overcome every trial. We rejoice because God is greater than every giant. We rejoice because no matter the shadowed valley, death has no power. So we won't fear. That's the kind of life we're called to live. One of trust, one of love. And yeah, it can be really difficult when God says, well, if you want to leave me, if you want to love me, then you're going to have to leave certain behaviors. If you want to follow me, then you're going to have to put me first. Oh, and that means not being upset when I save someone you don't like. Because Jesus did come to die for us all. And that means there's a good chance that you will probably see people in the hereafter that you don't like. Does that offend you? Well, shouldn't. God said, uh, you know, Christ. God, he says that our Father will bless those who do not fall away because of him, who are not offended because of him. Or are you going to be offended that God is here to save everyone, including you and me? And when God says he died to set the world right, then he means just that. And it means that when dealing with people who try us, who put us at our wit's end, who make us want to spit nails and roar with acid, that we have to live differently. That we can't behave the way they do. We cannot think the way the enemy does, the way the world does. We're in it, not of it. And that means we're called to live the love we are shown, even to people who piss us off. Well, I will continue into chapter 11 tomorrow, probably finishing out starting at verse 7. I'll see you guys then. May his favor be upon you. And know that you are loved. He'll see you through. So take up your cross, because Christ knows what to do. I'll see you guys tomorrow. God bless.